This thing on? Hi guys, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Reanimation of the uh, Badge Life Discord. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, color blasted badge making. How hard could it be? On our panel here, uh, we're going to start with Panda, who's going to talk about uh, UV printing. All right, so my name's Abino. Um, so I have been doing badge life for eight years now. And uh, it's a funny story how I started. I started very randomly. I was trying to make badges for an Indian conference. And I happened to just hang on to it instantly, and that's what I wanted to do. Over the time, we built our own uh, batch life lab with our own machineries and our fabrication and all the stuff. So we keep doing a hell lot of crazy, weird experiments with crazy failures and crazy successes. Um, so my technique for uh, the full color badge making uh, is UV printing, and so. You must have seen UV print. You must have seen UV printing in a lot of technology. Uh, they do, they print banners with it. Uh, uh, they print, they print acrylic and phone cases and a, a lot of a lot of stuff. And so, that is how the UV printer looks like. It's a it has a header that goes back and forth and try to you know it prints the stuff on it. Um, so my story started with. Uh, so these are all just the examples, and yeah. So the very important one, the RSA badge, is the is was our first UV printed badge. Um, the conference had a very unique logo with a, a specific shade of pink on the bottom right corner, and despite all the efforts, we couldn't get it done in the screen printing. And so uh, we got thinking, what could we do here? And um, yeah, what could we do here? And um, a sudden light bulb came up, and we heard like UV can print on anything. So we started doing those trials, and um, long story short, uh, that eventually uh, become our UV printing thing. And so we we bought our own UV printer, and over the course of time, we did. Um, a lot of badges. There's a Pacific Hackers badge, um, really cool community in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a Wombat badge from PCS Adelaide, and we're trying to mix around with with a lot of materials and a uh, lot of unique ideas. For example, the, the there's an old badge on the top, which is like combination of some gemstones and um, gold plating and so on. So um, we keep experimenting. Keep keep trying to find something new that's out there that's not yet done before, and so so this is how the process looks like. We the the machine has its own software, and so you can you can load your PNGs or PDFs in that. Um, you you adjust the print positions on the bed. The bed is basically the area that you print, um, and so. Uh, what we learn, what we eventually learn to do is we, we print directly on the bed first. So we print a layer on bed and then to, and we manually align each PCB on top of that bed and then print it once again. So that is how we uh, manage to fix the alignment issues, which is very common with your printing. Um, so the machine we have, this is actually the second machine we have. Um, it's, a, it's a local brand with with the custom Ipson header on it, because the machines are super super expensive. If you wanna go big, so um, this is like two feet by three feet. Fits in about 60, 70 badges, and on average, it's like a minute for each badge to print. Um, and there are many cheaper UV printers in market, and those take for, like longer time to cure thing. And uh, we tried with both assemble badges and pre-assemble badges. And if you assemble the badges first, you need to use the use the jig to keep things in place and not wobble it. Right, so a lot of experimentation. Um, I, I find out that when we print on assemble badges, it, the UV layer also prints on the components, on top of components. It colors the components as well, which is super funny. Um, and we, we the hand soldering is perfectly fine. There's no issue with hand soldering after you print. Um, uh, reflow on is where you uh, run into your first problems. The, when you reflow a UV printed layer, 
it, it, it turns a bit yellowish or it, it loses its shade. And for that, you have to keep adjusting the, if you get a UV printer, you have to keep experimenting a lot to find your sweet spot. And that's for every design and every batch. So there's a lot of experimentation involved. Um, and so uh, UV printer on its own is a super high maintenance. The, you have to print, on average, you should print something every day. So to keep it uh, healthy, so to speak, and not, not let the header dry. Um, yeah, and that, that's, that's what we have been doing for the most part. So um, uh, over the course of time, we, we, we built all this tech for, um, for patches that we made in-house. And um, I might start PCP assembly service or just UV printing service in future this year later on. So stay tuned. Um, yeah, off to Hamster now. Right, so it's Braden. We chose to do this alphabetically. <laughs> All right, so yeah, next we have Braden Lane, who's going to talk about screen printing as a different method. Yeah, so um, I'm Braden Lane, and actually I'd been talking to Panda quite a bit about colored PCBs, but I didn't have the uh, resources, I guess is a good choice of word, to do UV printing. And also in talking to Panda about the solutions and the challenges that uh, they were encountering about things like reflow, I started thinking about, well, what, what would be tolerant of the whole reflow process? Well, solder mask ink is going to be completely tolerant of it. So I said, well, if I've got ink, how can I print ink? And the answer was traditional silk screening. There we go. So this is me a few years ago uh, when I started this process. Uh, you can see it aged me quite a bit. Um, but this is not me, but this is the technology I use. It, it's the old school classic silk screening for making t-shirts. Um, I just applied it to doing printed circuit boards. Um, and so the entire process that you'd go through for traditional silk screening. Can you advance it for me? Thanks, yeah. I'm looking, that's the one, thank you. So the process is exactly the same as if you're doing a t-shirt. So I start out with, you know, publicly commercially available silk screens. They're aluminum frame and they've got a stretched silk screen on them. Uh, I go through the process of applying a UV exposed emulsion on them, just like you do for doing t-shirts. And then I expose that with UV light and if you look in the very center of that slide, there's some black and white. That's my negative. Um, and so I just expose the screen. It takes about eight minutes. And then I rinse them out, wash them out, and I end up with a screen. Once that screen has been washed out, I can, use, I can leave it for a year and it, it doesn't change. Um, and then I go through the process of setting up what would be a traditional silk screening piece of equipment. but for doing PCBs, which are very small, I want something that's very accurate. And so the only thing I had at my disposal that could allow me to align very accurately a silk screen to a PCB was my solder paste stenciling printer. So that's what you see the, um, the orange with the yellow uh, second to the right. That's actually just the standard manual solder paste stenciling piece of equipment that a lot of makers use when they're making their PCBs and putting down solder paste. I pull out my solder paste stencil and I put in my silk screening stencil. Um, and there's a quick example right there, but I want to bring up the samples page. There, there we go. Um, so some of the challenges that come to be is it doesn't really scale that well. So if we look at the bottom left corner, that is the 2023 challenge coin. I order PCBs from the manufacturer in black and white. And the white is anything that I want to be white, but the white is also anything I want to be color. And then I go through the process of silk screening any color. Well, one color is one entire silk screening process. Two colors is two entire silk screening processes. So that board had to go through the silk screening process four times, which meant it also had to be exposed to UV light four times and everything else is four times. And so it's good for adding a couple of colors, but you don't want to go wild with it. 
Um, you also really can't do, uh, you know, full RGB color with it. Um, it's just not going to work. What you can do is in the traditional silk screening process, there's something called um, a split fountain. We would know it as a gradient, but there is a difference between split fountain and a gradient. And actually, you can just see it in the DC Kids example. So what I ordered from the PCB manufacturer is the top one. I then did one pass in gray, and then I did one pass in a single pass with the red and blue, and then they blend together in the process of applying it. It's, now can we go to the, there we go. So I wanted to show this example of that same DC Kids badge. Um, you'll notice that the blue changed over time. So the, the left side of that bottom photo was the very first PCB that I squeegeed across. And the right side is the very last PCB that I squeegeed across. And you'll notice that the blues and the reds started to bleed together. So that was one of the issues I had to realize that if you do split fountain, yes, it's very creative, but it doesn't scale because after a certain number of PCBs, everything kind of be turns into mud. Um, another thing to think about is silk screening is ink. It's the old CMYK, which means when you think of, of digital art, if you mix red and blue together, you get a purple. In the world of inks, if you re mix red and blue together, you get a kind of a cocoa gray. And so you have to take that into account when you're mixing colors. It's not going to be like on a computer. It ends up being something very different. The other challenge, and I thank Panda for this because we were talking about both my technique of traditional silk screening and, and his technique of using um, UV printing, you still need to UV cure the inks afterwards. And when I did the original challenge coin, I just had fixed UV lights that I bought from online. And I learned that the closer they are to the PCB, the better they work. But they still need to be there for a period of time. And so what, what Panda had done was they had built, I think you built a custom conveyor system for yours. Well, I tried to do that and I failed miserably. But then I realized I have a conveyor system. It is my reflow oven. So I, <laughs> I popped open my reflow oven. I stacked in four UV lamps and I can now basically feed as fast as I can feed boards into it. It will UV cure them for me. So that's what that, that rig is in the upper, the upper, uh, upper corner there. Another difference between doing a, a T-shirt and doing a PCB is a PCB is very small versus a t-shirt. And so to get the level of detail that we grow accustomed to on PCBs, instead of using, say, a 100 or a 160 mesh, I end up at 230 and 305. Um, and 305 is now my standard. Uh, so from that standpoint, the technique is the same, but the equipment has to get more and more refined to keep the accuracy that we want. Um, I would say in general, it's more of an art than a science. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to, Pan, uh, to uh, Hamster. Next we have Hamster, and he's gonna describe yet another method of coloring called dye sublimation. All right, howdy, I'm Hamster. I've been doing uh, badge making for a number of years now. Um, I really like hacking the process. Um, I often wonder what the Chinese fabs think about us uh, abusing their machines to uh, do artistic things when historically, you know, they're used to square green boards coming out and here we are like trying to cram all this artwork into the process. Uh, so I've, in the process of trying to add color to PCBs, there's, there's lots of ways of doing uh, with the standard silk screen and uh, solder mask and copper to get colors, but I've always kind of wanted to do full color things. Um, I settled on dye sublimation mostly because uh, my wife is uh, an avid uh, uh, crafter and she buys all kinds of interesting things. Uh, she bought uh, an entire setup for doing dye sublimation to dye sub t-shirts and coffee mugs and such uh, to sell on, on Etsy, but the equipment sits idle for quite a while. 
And I kind of got to looking at it one day and I'm like, wait, I have some white PCBs. I wonder if the dye sublimation technique will work on PCBs. And it turns out that it does. Um, I was very surprised with it. Uh, the, the, it's a fairly simple process. Uh, you create the image on your computer. Uh, you modify your inkjet printer to use dye sub ink, which is cheap. Uh, you print it out on dye sub paper, which is cheap. Um, and then you put the PCB uh, onto the paper and put it in a t-shirt press, which is reasonably priced, uh, 150 bucks or so for a t-shirt, a uh, heated t-shirt press. And then your badge comes out the other end. So it's not painful. It's, uh, you can kind of go quick through these sort of things and it gives you the ability to get that, you know, whatever you put on the screen, you can get on the, the, the final PCB. Let's see. It'll go forward a slide. So for some examples here, sorry, if you go back a slide. So for some of the examples here, so like the DC Zia uh, badge that we did last year, uh, had a nice color gradient to it. Um, I've got another one of my friend Bob. I took a photo of him at one point and I made uh, these SAOs with his face on it, um, which uh, you can't really see in here, but the eyes bleed through. I've got some LEDs behind it, so it has a nice strobe effect with these eyes. Um, the only real downsides I've seen so far with it is that it's really hard to get rich colors out of it. So you, your black colors kind of get washed out. Uh, so you kind of have to take that into account. I, I'm experimenting with it still to see what I can do with it to try to help that situation out. Uh, but so far it's been working out for me. I think one more slide there. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the process. So this is kind of what it looks like for me with a PCB. So there at the top, I have the die, die sub paper where I've printed the image reversed on the paper. Uh, and I usually put an outline on it so I can kind of visually line up the board. Uh, one of the other issues with this system is that dye sub is a heat process. It won't go through a reflow oven uh, without losing most of your color. So you need to populate and reflow your boards first, and then you put them onto the dye sub paper, tape it down with some Kapton tape, polymide tape, um, and then it goes into the heat press. So I usually have to use, like, I've got some bits of flooring that I use to space the uh, uh, board up off of the press. Uh, so that the components can fit underneath there. And then it's, you know, uh, about 30 seconds in the press at about 360 degrees Fahrenheit. You pull them off, let them cool down, peel it off, and uh, you have uh, the final result. So it, the, the fun part about this is that it's a cheap enough process. Um, we have a convention back in uh, Utah, St. Con, that's reasonably close to my house that it's kind of fun to see what's happening at St. Con, go home at the end of the night and then make a whole bunch of SAOs the next day that are topical. So it's really neat to be able to turn these things around very quickly. It also allows for when I design the badge, artwork can come later. I can concentrate on getting the hardware done and then the artist can work on it and then art can literally uh, slap on at the very end. I think that's it. Nope. I guess I do have one more slide. Uh, some of the tricks about it is uh, time and temperature uh, make a big difference. So I always have to make sure that I have enough extra boards so that I can try out, okay, do I need to go a little hotter? Do I need to go longer so that I get the best color transfer? Because it can vary wildly, as you can see in these images. So again, really hard to get that deep black color, but it's really easy to not get the deep black color. Um, and the whole setup for me anyway, uh, under $250, I'm all in on this. So it's, it's approachable by, you know, the, the home gamer to put this together. It's not overly painful to do this process. I think I've done like a hundred panels in about four hours and been okay with that. So. All right. So this is formatted as a panel. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, I'd ask that we kind of come up and form a line. Um, if you don't have any questions, uh, if you don't have any questions, I've got some that I can ask the panel. So, uh, so yeah. Um, we'll start off with a couple of those. Um, so a question for Panda, how long does it take to fully color one badge? Um, so depending on how you place those PCBs or the bed, um, for me it takes a minute if I um, cover 
used the entire bed, which was like two feet by three feet. Um, could be like one and a half minutes if we use maybe half the bed or something. Okay. Got a couple of people up here. So oh, and I'm going to steal your mic, actually. I think they've got a mic down there, maybe. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Okay. I think yeah. there's, a, there's a mic on the floor there for that. So you guys had talked about how there's uh, different issues with color quality across the different methods. Uh, if you wanted to do... Matte versus shiny, like, does that come into these different methods as well? Have you seen sort of like one method is more capable than others for that? He's asking if you have to worry about matte versus shiny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, you guys focused on color quality, but uh, what about finish, like matte versus shiny? Um, how can you kind of control that? Yeah. And do you want that from all three of us? Okay, so I'll start. So in the world of silk screening, it's going to be one finish. It's going to be sort of a semi... It's, it, the truth is, is in silk screening, I am using actual PCB UV ink. So it's going to be the same as your solder mask, the same as your, your silk screen that you'd get from a PCB manufacturer. Most of the time, that's going to be a fairly glossy finish. Um, it's possible to add a matting agent to it, but in general, because this is more, in my case, it's more art than science, that's going to be very variable. So my default is I would never try for a matte finish. I'm always going to get the, the, the default glossy finish of a UV ink. Yeah, similar for me, it's it's going to be whatever the surface of the PCB is, since it's so s small amount of ink that's getting transferred over. So whatever that standard silk screen or solder mask layer is going to be, it's going to end up being like that. Right. So uh, for the UV printing, the, the default is matte finish. Um, but I have this one example here where uh, we tried, so this is like, UV printed on a HL surface and then we put like a varnish coating on it. So that has brought in a, flat a little bit of uh, glossy finishing to it. If not that, then you can um, try putting like an acrylic layer and that has like nothing gets more glossier than this. So this is like the gold standard of being glossy. But as far as UV printing goes, the default is matte finish. Yeah. Okay. I have a and for Panda, um, Brayden was saying that you uh, reflow, or not reflow, but you pass your boards under the UV light on a con custom conveyor thing. Uh, so one question is, doesn't the UV printer cure the ink as it's printing? So why would it need to go through a second time? And also, um, I forgot my other question. So that's the only one I got. Thanks. Yeah. So when we were experimenting with the screen printing and we we're trying to put more and more layers on 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 colors basically on top of one another and so we wanted a faster way to cure those colors so we built that custom uv uv curing conveyor belt and that was when we using we use it right now to for the masking ink uh, so usually on the back side of the board and for the UV printing, the of course the UV printer, it cures the ink instantly when you use the UV printer. So it sprays the color from one nozzle and then um, it goes back and forth and back and forth and the it, the curing time for it is like instant. It doesn't take too long. So there's two UV curing now we are doing it. One for masking and then one for UV. And I remember my other question. So you said you printed on the bed to a line. Um, are you doing like a full print or are you just kind of doing like an outline print? Yeah, wow. so when we're using the full bed, um, sometimes we're able to fit like 50 or even 60 badges, um, depending on the size. So we typically print on the entire bed. And yeah, But are you printing full color? Yeah, we're printing full color 
on the entire bed. Why? Um, we we need to do that one because we need to ensure the the print is coming out right and it has enough resolution. Um, second, the color correction on it. So sometimes um, we put like a banner, which is like a your standard you know banners and white color banner, and you just um, basically uh, print on that banner and you have better color cor color correction when you print on that and then you just so once we print on just the bed and then we just then we just keep um, keep the pcbs on it and then at the exact spot and print it once more so yeah. thank you yeah thank you yes yeah, so this was one of the badge we did we we combined um fr4 with masking so so the side the, the portion where there are leds that's like fr4 and rest of the pcb is like proper white masking so that was like a combination and more experimentation on how we how we print and yeah for UV printing can you print transparently if you wanted to avoid printing on top of leds that were already populated uh certainly so the the way uv printer works is the it prints the file that you provide and so when we want that a certain area should not be printed, we need to make that area transparent. And that can happen only in PNG format. So the trick here is you need to, one, you need to make sure you have a good source file. And when you have the good source file, you convert that to really high risk PNG with close to 500 DPI. And you make those areas transparent where you do not want the print. And how high does the print head traverse? Like if you had um, potentiometers or something that were high and populated already, can you adjust the height or how does it work? Uh, adjust the height of the... Of the print head that's sweeping um, over it. You can, you can adjust the height of the print head, but I don't think it will make a difference for potentiometer. So it's either way, it's, it's still going to get... Um, um, it's still going to get printed on if you don't have that um, removed in the file. You don't have that transferred in the file. But th so the print head is how high off the board typically? That's typically like 10, 5 to 10 centimeters high. It's not too, too much. Oh, but so can you raise that if you had a higher component? Um, you can raise that, but we, we haven't um, played around with that because almost all of our badges are totally flush on front side. We don't put components on front side to avoid the issue in the first place. Um, but a, a good turnaround for that is you just um make those areas transparent in the png file and that should avoid printing over it okay and are there any concerns with printing on both sides i mean i guess you just flip it over next like any other um no not at all the only concern is you you have to uh deduct each and every single component if you don't want to be printing on those components on top of those components so that is just a lot of manual uh, manual work so to speak okay this is going to be a little queer the, the uh as a panel member, I'm going to ask a question of everybody on the panel. So for each of these three techniques, when do you color the PCB in the assembly process? Yeah, for the dye sublimation, I color a PCB just before I assemble them. So it'll be close to the last thing I do. Um, I've already populated everything. Um, it's ready to be bolted together or whatever is needed. So it's very tail end of things. Yeah, so for UV, um, it's similar. It's, it's right in the end. Um, sometime it is before the assembly and sometime it's, it, it's right after the assembly. It depends on the artwork. Yeah, okay. That, the re and that's actually why I wanted to ask the question because in the case of silk screening, traditional silk screening, it's the very first process. So literally, as soon as my PCBs arrive from the manufacturer, I run them through the silk screening process because they're completely tolerant of heat no matter how much heat I bake into them. It doesn't matter because it's, it's solder mask inks. And so I do it before I even start the whole process of paste and population and reflow. Um, so mine's at the very beginning of the process rather than anywhere in the middle or the end. Yeah. Well, all right. If you guys don't have any further questions, I've got some more. So uh, this question is for Hamster. Uh, if if I'm ordering badges, how many extras should I order to print and test and perfect the process? Yeah, that's a good question. I typically try to order like an extra between 25 and 30 blanks. 
Um, and usually I will end up using the front and back of them uh, to try to get to dial in color temperature, trying to dial in artwork, uh, registration. Um, if you're still wishy-washy about what you want the design to look like and you want to see it on a real thing, you might consider bumping that number up a little bit. Um, I usually do runs of about 100 badges, so it is a substantial amount, but uh, cost-wise, it's really not much money. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Panda, but you might all answer this. Um, any failure stories and any interesting ways you corrected them? Um, we have had some failure stories all the time, and um, if you go back to slides, uh, how do you? <laughs> yeah. Let me. Uh, yeah. So me when we that. started, uh, uh, one of the first challenges, of course, the the ink turning yellowish after you reflow, and um, that we figured out like maybe we'll just like print it after like assembly, and that solved the problem, and then. The other time we just kept experimenting to find the accurate temperature to um, reduce the impact as much as possible. So uh, there are some badges here. So some of the badges shown here, um, we did uh, a lot of refining with each badge and each, every process. Um, so one of the badge uh, in particular we had seen it, it had like a flaking of or like a peeling of issue um, and uh, which was like the wombat badge actually it was from a conference called B Size Adelaide and so um, what happened is uh, it, it for, like we couldn't figure out why because it never happened before and it had the, the coating was started to kind of peel off and so we talked to manufacturer and we asked what the hell is this and they were like we don't know um we have never given you inks for like the pcbs and stuff and so uh, we started getting into it and they were like yeah maybe it has to do with moisture in australia or like the the heat in Aust or the even part of it was outdoor so maybe it was outdoor heat in australia so um we kept going through it and um we still don't know exactly why it happened but um we are trying. We we tried recreating it, and we couldn't recreate. So uh, that was one of the, like a small um, uh, failure story, so to speak. And eventually, we realized we could just avoid printing the masking at all, and then, then we just just print on FR4 plan, and that that seemed to fix the problem. I think it was due to the ink um, being printed on a glossy surface that that was resulting in in those things. Yeah, I'd say for me. Man, I hate inkjet printers. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of times is uh, my, my die sub printer will sit for a long time. And if I don't remember to print a nozzle check once in a while, uh, I start to lose uh, uh, nozzles. And uh, it really sucks when uh, you're counting on the thing and you go to print it and half your nozzles aren't printing and the color is coming out wrong and you're under the wire. Um, I... There is a process out there for doing laser, for doing dice up with laser, but uh, the cartridges are way more expensive. Dice up ink is like 40 bucks, gets you like 400 millimeter bottle or 100 milliliter bottles of ink. But uh, the laser process, you're looking at like 500 bucks in toner. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wish I could get rid of uh, the inkjet printer part of it. Um, outside of that, some of the very early runs I did, I didn't really take into account how many boards I would need to test to get the color or get the time and temperature correct. And uh, I just about ran out of boards getting trying to get it down before I uh, started eating into the actual production run. The Probably the biggest process problem I ran into, and I never would have thought this was the case, was registration and it isn't the registration of my silk screen to my PCB it turned out the fact that as I pointed out in mine I have the black and the white printed by the PCB manufacturer and then I do the colors on top of that which means my registration of my silk screen art has to be 100 percent accurate to whatever process the printed circuit board manufacturer did. And I found that for whatever reason, my nice high quality laser printer has about a 1.5% error in one axis only. 
which meant I have to go back and scale my artwork and stretch it in one access only to get my art that goes onto the silk screen to match up with the art that came from the PCB manufacturer. And I had never anticipated that that would be a problem. Once I found it and documented it, it was easy to resolve. Um, but that was the one thing I never anticipated happening. What I did find that makes my life a lot easier is the UV inks, both for the emulsion on my silk screen and then the UV ink itself. I started out with the, you know, the traditional darkroom set with the amber lights and the timers and all that stuff because I was afraid of things getting overexposed or exposed out of, out of sync and stuff. I found out the stuff is really, really tolerant. So I just do it in my garage with the lights turned off on a cloudy day and it's fine. The exposure of my screens is about eight minutes. And so what I do is I wash out all my old screens in one day, emulsion, you know, dry them out and then apply an emulsion to them and then stack them in a box. And two or three months later, when I need a screen, I pull it out, I put the artwork on it and I expose it. And then it sits until the PCBs arrive. So I can do things in stages, which saves me a lot of time. But the, the alignment of my laser printer to what the Chinese company did that did, did the PCBs, I never anticipated that that would be an issue. So this question is for Braden again. Uh, so along that same line of getting started, uh, what did you need to get started, and um, what special equipment did you add, and why? So when I, when I started, I looked at it as traditional silk screening, and so I just went on online and bought, I think I started originally with the, a 230 mesh, because I found an article that said, you know, you get sort of good accuracy and fairly high resolution with a 230 mesh screen, and those screens are... 17 or 18 dollars a piece and i bought i think two of them and so that was my initial and then i realized okay you can get emulsion films but they're expensive and stuff but a tub of emulsion will last me years and it cost me 12 or 15 bucks and a squeegee was three or four dollars and a uv lamp was i think 18 or 20 bucks and that's all i had to get started um along the line to make things go faster. You know, I got two more screens and eventually I got two more after that. And the last two, I went to a 305 mesh, which is basically it's 300 DPI in screen format. Um, and instead of using one LED UV lamp that is rated at, uh, I think 60 or 75 Watts, um, I went to two and eventually I'm now at four. Um, that sit inside my reflow oven in a conveyor. Um, the one thing that Panda taught me that was really useful was the proximity of the UV lamps to the board. I started out at like eight inches and it was taking forever for me to cure my, my boards with the ink on it. I got it down to about 10 or 15 centimeters, which is about a half inch. And then it was like really fast. Um, but the, the, to get started, it was probably 65 or $70. And I would probably say I'm into it now for $250 or $300. Um, I started out, I found out that literally the little 100 milliliter container of UV ink in each color was more than enough to do hundreds of boards. So I didn't need the big, you know, one kilo uh, tub of ink. The little ones were more than enough to get me through all my designs. This is for Hamster first. Um, speaking of quantity, uh, how viable is it for you to do like 100 badges versus 500 badges? Um, so like scaling, time, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this mic is still on. Can you guys hear? Oh, our mic's not. There you go. Yeah, so it's fairly scalable. Um, doing 100 boards isn't painful if i was doing a thousand boards i'd probably rethink a, a lot of things uh, beyond just trying to put color on it but it, a lot of the process is kind of automated like you have to print out uh, you have every single board has to get a printout so you, you have that time to bake into it but you know the printer can go off and do its thing unless you've got a printer like mine that every fifth sheet decides that it can't recognize one of the color tanks um and then uh, you have to tape each one of them individually onto each uh, printed thing and then put it through the heated t-shirt press. 
you kind of get into a rhythm, but I probably wouldn't want to do more than, say, 250 boards through this process without rethinking life. Okay. Uh, did, you, did either of you want to answer that one? It's so like, how, again, how well does it scale and how does it impact time to do more? Yeah, uh, I think in terms of scale, is extremely scalable. Um, we have done like uh, the the thing is, it just takes like initial setup, as I said, to uh, to set up the bed and to to do the to do the alignment and um, do the initial print and that. But afterwards, it's just um, it's just about printing on and on. So it it's. It's, it doesn't make a difference if you do 100 or you do 10,000. So it's very, very scalable. For me, the scalability comes down to the size of the PCB. So if the PCB is so big that I can only put one under the silk screen at a time, then the squeegeeing process takes, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, lifting the board out, putting it away. And so, you know, it's a lot of manual steps. When I did the first e-challenge coin, I did the silk screening in panel form. So all of a sudden that one squeegee was four challenge coins at a time. If I had done those panels at eight, it would be eight challenge coins in that same 15 seconds. So from that standpoint, my scalability comes down to the manual labor and it really comes down to how many, bo how many of the end unit PCBs can I fit on my silk screen in one shot? And that's the way I, that's the only way I can scale from a reality standpoint. Um, a hundred boards or a hundred panels is fairly easy because they say, you know, like I said, they take, you know, 20 or 30 seconds maximum between them. So that was fairly easy. And because the e-challenge coin, there was four coins on a panel, that was 400 coins. Um, and so that went fairly quickly. Uh, but if I had had to do a board that I could only put one, you know, one badge down at a time, you know, I probably would start to rethink after about 100 or 150. All right. Uh, this one's for Panda. Um, you've made a lot of different badges, and, and it seems like you've experimented a lot. Can you tell us uh, about your experiments with different materials and boards? Right. So, let me get this right. Right. So, um, so over there on the corner, we have um, the owl bash, the red one, and that was the combination of gold gold plated PCB with with the with the gemstone on it, and the gemstone was like um, um well like the main main focus of it was like the point was the, was to make the PCB as special as possible. Um, so there was that combination of gemstone and U printing and gold plating. There's a Budubot bash which is like red and um, there's a white, uh, it's called hurricane in it. So that was a really interesting, um, like a crash course in light diffusion. And I hated that topic in school. And so what happened is they had this idea, they, they were basically like, we want to make a digital version of our logo. It needs to glow as brightly as possible at every inch on it. Um, no close spots and no shadow spots on it, which is what typically what happens in piece beads. Um, so we just filled the, the board with red and white LEDs at first, and then we are testing it, and we put one layer of acrylic, and we can see that uh, some spots are glowing too high, and then some some spots are like not glowing too high, and as a result, the the higher the spots with more glow were like yellowish, and the others were like reddish. And so we kept reiterating and then we were thinking, well, how can we make this better? And so we put one layer of white on the bottom and then we print the artwork once again and we see how that turns out. And that seemed to improvise. We were like, okay, cool. So let's do one more layer. And so, and that seemed to improvise further. So now we are at three UV print layers on the bottom and then one UV print layer on the top. And that is how that badge ended up becoming. Uh, it was like a four layer on top of one another on an acrylic. And that is mounted with a screw on a PCB um, to distribute all that glow um, to just as equally as that we wanted. Um, so there was that badge. Um, there was, of course, the Pacific Hackers I talked about. Uh, combination of FR4 on side 
uh, with LEDs behind it and um, just the masking for the most part. Um, there's um, Wombat with a, with a drill hole right in the center and um, so we, over the course of time, we did fair amount of experiments. Um, yeah, that should be, yeah. Uh, quick, fo quick follow up to that. Um, yours is obviously the, probably the most costly of all the, uh, the setups in terms of equipment. So if, what would you say equipment that you're using here to do UV printing would cost if you were to build your own? Right, so uh, the first printer we bought, it was a, a still a local brand and um, that worked just all right. We, we did, um, there's an astronaut badge in the bottom, we did that with that printer. Um, there's um, a world a global thing and that badge we did, we did with that printer and they turned out okay. But I had this really bad thought of it. It's not, it's not printing black, blacker enough. And so we go out and try to make it better. And uh, the first UV printer we bought was close to $10,000. Um, and then somehow we thought we, we had to keep doing better and we had to keep improvising. So we went ahead and bought another printer which was much larger and could uh, do badges faster and print faster. And that was another $10,000 in the hole. Um, so, um, and we figured that it still wasn't actually there where we wanted. And so we take out its head and we put an Epson head on it. So now it's our own custom badge UV printer with so much of uh, funds went into it that it's now, uh, yeah, it's a white elephant for us, but um, it's a lovely white elephant. I, I, I love that machine. So, um, so yeah, so if you want a good UV printer, there's typically they start at 10. If you want the really, really fancier ones, those are like 50,000. Um, but you know, you don't need that. That would be like overkill. So a, a standard one somewhere, if you just want to make one badge a year, that I think should be around 5,000 or something. Um, but don't take my word for it. The, the ink varies. Uh, what the manufacturer recommends you for inks, those inks vary and the cost varies. And as I said, it's a very high maintenance machine. So you can't, you can't push it in a um, you know, storage unit for a year and expect it to work on like 365 days. So uh, yeah, it's a lot of heavy use, heavy maintenance thing. Yeah. so. That should give some idea. All right, this will be my last question. We got about four minutes left. Um, so you each chose your own printing method. Uh, starting with you, Braden, um, would you choose the same method again? Would you would you use silk screening again, or would you maybe consider one of your your uh, colleagues' printing methods here? Yes. <laughs> um, I like the artistic side of silk screening and. I will do it again. I will pick a project very carefully for it or vice versa. I will pick the process of color very careful for the project that I want to do. Um, and I'll be totally honest. So I originally had planned to do what is now the DC next gen badge using traditional silk screening. There was a decision made fairly late in the game where they needed very specific Pantone accurate color. And I couldn't guarantee that in my technique. It just, I mean, I, I could have tried, but it would have been a massive amount of trial and error to get to an accurate Pantone color. And so ultimately for that badge, I transitioned to a manufacturer to do the UV printing for me. Um, and so if I either have to scale very large on a large badge, I would use UV printing. Um, but I would like to do silk screening, knowing now where it works well and where it doesn't work. Um, and so don't be surprised if you see at least one next year that's traditional silk screening. Um, I like the art side of it. It's a, it's a very tactile experience to play with inks. Yeah, I... I like hacking with a process and uh, silk screening sounds scary, which means I really want to try it now. Uh, so I may have a process next year where I do partial silk screen and then dye sublimation because I got to keep that inkjet printer from clogging up anyway. 
Yeah, I think um, we were doing silk screening a, a, a lot of times uh, when we started and we really trying to do something unique every time. Um, but as the number of patches grew, um, we, we kept realizing we had to find something more scalable. And uprinting was that unexpected moment that uh, helped us scale to the scale where we are making uh, almost a badge or many badges a month um, somewhere across the world. So um, even if I wanted to, um, maybe for a smaller uh, limited badge runs, I would really love to go back to sales screening and try to do some, you know, do stuff there. But as the situation is right now, we can't let go of you printing, um, yeah, for the scalability and, and yeah, and the, the, the efficiency and speed that it offers. All right. I think that I think that does it for our questions. Um, any final questions from the audience? That looks like a no. So thank you very much to our panelists. We appreciate you guys sharing your knowledge. And that's it. Thank you.